Hello guys, and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about quantum entanglement. It's a topic that is usually seen as complex, but is rather spooky. So spooky, in fact, that Einstein coined the term spooky action at a distance to explain its strange phenomena. It fueled many debates between Bohr and Einstein, and helped create the view of quantum mechanics that we know today. So without further ado, let's get into it. According to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, all particles exist in a state of all possible states called superposition. This superposition is represented by the wave function. The higher the wave, the higher the probability is to find the particle there. The particle stays in superposition until we measure it. That's when the wave function collapses into what we know as a particle. How that happens is irrelevant information for what we're talking about here. But if you want more information on that subject, click right here to see my video on that. Now the wave function collapse is random, so we can't predict what the wave function collapse will be. The best we can do is predict the probability of getting a specific superposition. Predictability was one of the most essential and downright obvious concepts in physics, and now it was shattered. Einstein was especially ticked off and famously said, God does not play dice with the universe. Einstein was very skeptical and thought there might be more to this than meets the eye. In 1935, he co-authored the EPR paper along with Podolsky and Rosen, hence the name. In it, he imagined we have two photons. We, we take these two photons and we collide them with each other. And here's where the problem comes. According to the conservation of angular momentum, the total angular momentum of both particles combined must equal the angular momentum before the collision. Now, now subatomic particles don't actually have angular momentum, but they have an equivalent called spin. Now, I'm not going to dive into spin too much this video, but here's a quick overview of what spin is. S spin is pretty much angular momentum, but for subatomic particles. Now, the particles are actually spinning. It's more about the orientation of a particle's magnetic field. The, the, the name spin comes from an experiment where a spinning iron cylinder creates a magnetic field. You can measure spin by running, by running the particle through two magnets, sort of like this. If the, if the particle's magnetic field aligns with the magnets and it deflects upward, it's called spin up and it has positive spin. If it anti-aligns with the magnet's magnetic field, then it deflects downward, and it's called spin down. It has a negative spin. Particles can only be spin up or spin down, no matter how you orient the axis. You can turn it horizontally, and it would still be spin up or spin down. That's because the spin of the particles is quantized, sort of like the electrons in the Bohr model, where they can, o where, where they can only have specific values, nothing in between. What this now implies is that if you were to take these two particles and put them, say, light years away, and you measured the first particle, figuring out it was spin up, with, aka with a spin of one, you would instantaneously know that the spin of the second particle has to be negative one to keep angular momentum conserved. What this means is that if the first, if the fir if we collapse the wave function of the first particle, the wave function of the second particle collapses instantaneously. And remember, these are light years away, which means the information is traveling faster than the speed of light, thus violating Einstein's general theory of relativity, which he laid out in 1915. This is what Einstein called entanglement, and it's what bothered him so much. Before measurement, the particles are in a superposition of spin up, spin down, and spin down, spin up. And it can be written like this. The symbol right here is called psi, and it represents the wave function. Notice that the states of the two particles are part of the same superposition. That's when you know that the two particles are entangled. To get the probability, you simply square the wave function, which gives you this equation. Notice that both states have a probability of one half, as the total probability of the wave function always adds up to one. Einstein proposed that there must be a deeper range of quantum mechanics that explains the spins of these particles. He says that the particles already knew what the spins were before we measured them. We just don't have the information to figure that out. For example, the second particle already knew that if it was measured in the vertical axis, it would get 
spin down. We just weren't able to figure that out. For a long time, people considered this problem as one of metaphysics. After all, how can you figure out what the spin of a particle was before you measured it? And how would you distinguish that from a random 50-50 collapse of, a wave, of the wave function? For a long time, people just left it at this, waiting for a discovery that could help test the hypothesis. That is, until an Irish physicist entered the scene. Enter in John Stuart Bell, an Irish physicist who has found a surprisingly intuitive way to test Einstein's hypothesis. And it did not require any new scientific breakthroughs. Before he came along, physicists would only measure spin in one of two axes, in the y-axis or the x-axis. He proposed adding a third axis, with all three axes being 120 degrees from each other, sort of like this. This was an insight that changed physics forever. Imagine you have two detectors, and in the center of them you have a device that can create two entangled particles and shoot them out to the detectors. The detectors make a random measurement on one of the three axes, chosen randomly. What Bell did now was figure out the probability of getting the same spin for both detectors according to the hidden variable theory. If this aligned with the measurement results, it would mean that the hidden variable theory is true. According to Einstein's hidden variable theory, the particles already know what their, what their spin will be on every single axis. Their only limitation is that particle A and B can't have the same spin on the same axis. Using this knowledge, let's assume that particle A measures spin up for the first axis, spin down for the second axis, and spin up for the third axis. Particle B measures the opposite spins, with spin down for the first axis, spin up for the second axis, and spin down for the third axis. We already know they can't have the same spin on the same axis. So axis one and one, two and two, and three and three all have opposite spins. Particle A is measured on the first axis and particle B is measured on the second axis, you get the same spin. And if particle A is measured on the first axis and particle B is measured on the third axis, you get opposite spins. If particle A is measured on the second axis, particle B is measured on the first axis, you get the same spin. And if particle A is measured on the second axis and particle B is measured on the third axis, you also get the same spin. If particle A is measured on the third axis and particle B is measured on the first axis, you get opposite spins. And if particle A is measured on the third axis and particle B is measured on the second axis, you get the same spin. All the other possible combinations are fundamentally equivalent, just in a different order. The only one that's fundamentally different here is the up, 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 and down, down, down state, where zero out of the nine possible combinations are the same. And so using both of those situations, the probability for getting the same spin according to the hidden variable theory is less than or equal to four-ninths of the time. It wasn't until around the 1970s when a physicist named Alan Aspect performed Bell's experiment and the results were astonishing. The particles showed the same spin 50% of the time, less than probabilities indicated by Einstein's hidden variable theory. This meant that Einstein's theory and all local hidden variable theories like it were, were false. What this ultimately implies is that the universe is non-local, meaning two objects can interact with each other without anything traveling between them. Locality was therefore abandoned. The last question to ask you is, does spooky action at a distance really violate Einstein's general theory of relativity? The common consensus among physicists is no. Nothing tangible here is traveling between the two particles. Now, why that happens is controversial and highly debated between different interpretations of quantum mechanics. But one theory is that both of them are part of the same wave function. So when one part of the wave function is measured, the whole wave function collapses. Now, if you're wondering, can we use quantum entanglement to send messages faster than the speed of light? The answer is no, and there's two reasons behind that. First, the collapse of the wave function is random, so you can't force the wave function collapse into a specific spin. For example, you can't, you can't assign spin up 
with a specific message because you can't control if your particle collapses to be spin up or spin down. The second reason is that the receiver doesn't even know if you've measured the particle or not. To the receiver, a collapsed wave function and a wave function that just collapsed are indistinguishable. So there's no way of sending a message through the means of if the wave function is collapsed, then this. That's it for today. If you want to see more videos like this, click right here to subscribe to my channel. If you want to see more content like this, click here or here to view some of my other videos. That's it for today. I'm Zay, and I'll see you next time on the Universe of Physics.